Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what Mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio. Join George Smart and Frank King as they talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Show your support by visiting U.S. Modernist's massive, highly addictive archive at usmodernist.org. And now... Two guys who can't wait to finish each other's sentences. <laughs> Frank King and George Smart. And braid their hair. Uh, I'm Frank King, and I am the illegitimate son of one Neutra or the other. <laughs> Support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from Mod Homes Realty, a.k.a. the wonderful, intelligent, lovely, talented Sarah Song. The real estate agent who gets modern like you do. Sarah Song doesn't want any more modernist teardowns. I'm sure you don't either. She's great for sellers who want their homes to endure and great for buyers who need her expertise, experience, and passion. You can find her at www.modhomesrealty.com or 919-601-7339. George? And I'm George Smart, and our guest today is Allison Arif, Editorial Director of SPUR, which is a San Francisco-based think tank promoting urban planning in the Bay Area. With an extensive background in art history, plus eight years of ballet, Allison writes about architecture, design, and cities for the New York Times, California Sunday, Wired, MIT Technology Review, and City Lab. She's a former editor-at-large for Good and Sunset magazines, and was a founding editor at Dwell, one of our favorite design publications. Allison is also the author of Prefab, Trailer Travel, A Visual History of Mobile America, and Airstream, The History of the Land Yacht. I, the I, Land I, Yacht, I, soon we'll be making another run. The <laughs> Land Yacht promises, promises something for everyone. everyone. I guess that <laughs> yeah. makes you Captain Steubing, George. Well, who's going to be Gover? No, more importantly, who's going to be bartender? <laughs> so for no apparent reason, Allison, we do break into song here sometimes. Okay, back to the introduction. <laughs> Uh, you've heard her on NPR, KQED Forum, The Diane Reem Show, The Sundance Channel, HGTV, CNN Money, and 99% Invisible. What? No interviews on Fox or InfoWars or Alex Jones? I do believe the um, the building on Mars where the um, the orphans that are being stolen and flown to is a modernist <laughs> structure there on no the doubt. red planet. I guess the right wing isn't into urban planning. Last but not least, as an author and writer, Allison is constantly generating great content. But there's one book she's read more than any other. And we'll start off by asking Allison to tell us the story of Nuffle Bunny, A Cautionary Tale. Could you summarize the plot for our listeners who haven't read it, Allison? Wow, this must have been a, a, a several years old interview you found. <laughs> Nuffle Bunny is brilliant. It's by Mo Willems. He's an author and illustrator. It's a children's book, obviously, um, about a small child who loses her stuffed animal. Trixie. Trix, Trixie, who loses her stuffed animal um, when she inadvertently swaps it with a girl at school. And the parents are forced to meet in Brooklyn in the dark of night to switch the bunnies. But then the girls become best friends. And I haven't read that in a while, but I've probably read it more, yes, more than almost any other book. But my daughter's 11, so she's a little advanced past Nuffle Bunny, but still <laughs> fondly recalls it. I had never seen this book, and I want to encourage all our listeners to pick this up. It is a brilliant little book. You just can't help but feeling good at the end. Definitely. He's amazing, Mo, Mo Williams. I would highly recommend him. He's written probably 50 children's books. They're all fantastic. So, Allison, Nuffle Bunny, A Cautionary Tale. Is there a cautionary tale for cities and towns in urban planning? Nice segue. <laughs> <laughs> ba -dum -bum. Well, there are so many cautionary tales. Um, I, I don't know where to start. Um, Just pick one. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you called to talk about uh, Silicon Valley, so yes. we'll talk a little bit about that as a cautionary tale. You know, every place in the world wants to be Silicon Valley. 
I probably read an article every day, you know, Ohio's the next Silicon Valley, Austin's the next <laughs> Silicon Valley. Uh, I read something to Shenzhen is the next, no. you know, innovation of Silicon Valley. Um, so no one's going to be the next Silicon Valley, but but place they might be the next innovation center in in different ways but i would i would caution any place that wanted to be the next silicon valley to take a good look at everything that's going wrong here i mean there's a lot of money around that's for sure but there's intractable traffic uh the median home price in cupertino where the new apple headquarters is is 1.8 million dollars that's the median the median home value right um, this is in large part because people are tired of how many people have been coming here. So there's um, a very healthy contingent of people who don't want any more housing built, don't want to put any more money into infrastructure, thinking somehow that that will keep more people from coming here or people will get so fed up and will leave. Um, that's not been happening. So everything's just getting more and more crowded. Uh, we are way behind on transit capacity, way behind on housing production. Seattle has built, I think, and I, my numbers are not going to be 100% accurate, but I believe it's about 70,000 units in Seattle during the same period where San Francisco has built about 7,500. Wow. Um, so... If you want to be the next Silicon Valley, you need to actually do urban planning <laughs> and adhere to those plans and uh, build capacity both in housing and transit as population grows, which is something we definitely have not done here in the Bay Area and are sort of suffering the consequences in many different aspects of, of our daily, daily lives. Allison, is um, Marin County, is that in the Bay Area? Marin County is in the Bay Area. Yes, and there's a story, one of my favorite, it's um, Skywalker Ranch. Who's the um, movie mogul? Joe, Skywalker George, Ranch. Lucas. George, Lu- George Lucas. Yes, uh, and he wanted to expand the ranch, and the neighboring or the city council or whatever for the area didn't want it to happen, and they set up all these hoops for him to jump through, and after jumping through three or four, he, he was fed up. He said, because they didn't want him to expand the ranch, the mm-hmm. production facility. So he said, uh, fine. So I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he initiated, um, he's going to build a goodly number of moderately priced homes right. on that same piece of property, which, of course, was his revenge to the local city council. Which which says, okay, so uh, full disclosure, I grew up in Marin County. Uh, I'm. It's one of the wealthiest counties in California. It was not quite so fancy when I was a child there, but now um, if the median home price in Cupertino is 1.8, it's probably that in a lot of um, Marin as well. Um, I thought you were bringing Marin up because just last week, Marin managed to get an exception uh, in the regional plan they asked for special dispensations so they as a county would not have to build any additional multifamily housing, even though the rest of the region is required to do so under planned Bay Area. Who, who would grant that permission? You know, it was one of those housing bills where Donald um, Trump surely he was. They involved. asked. They asked for the uh, no. Donald Trump wouldn't because he would. There's an article today about how he stands to gain from uh, affordable housing built by NYCHA in New York City. Big surprise. Something of like like that he would get some percentage of um, of the new projects built under HUD right now. Which oh. uh, anyway, that's a whole different story. But yeah, so Marin asked for. Um, an exclusion that they wouldn't need to build any additional housing. And at this point, it looks on track to go through unless someone actually stands up and does something. But um, it's pretty absurd. And this is sort of the larger problem um, in the Bay Area as a whole, that everyone says, oh, yeah, we need more housing, but no city or town is willing to take the responsibility, spend the money, uh, do the work to to get it built. So everyone's just passing the buck all the time, blaming everybody else on on uh, high housing costs, and it's a mess. So Allison, is the county motto "Stay the hell out"? Basically, <laughs> when I was in high school, my high school motto, not official, but certainly among my classmates, was "Redwood is my island." <laughs> wow. <laughs> and that's kind of kind of how it is. I was just noticing Allison in your story in the New York Times uh, yesterday. That you said some companies are even offering employees lots of money to delocate from the region, yes. go somewhere else that's more affordable. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Well, 
Well, if you think of it, I mean, it is amazing. But so let's say you're a young engineer and Google offers you, let's be generous, $200,000 starting salary. You're still hard pressed to find a house that you could afford on that income. And so companies are having to pay these ridiculous salaries to engineers in particular because they're in such high demand, uh, even more so if all these various travel bans go through. (laughs) Um, Oh, yeah, right. So a lot of companies are quietly shifting other uh, aspects of their um, workforce to other places, um, further out in the Bay Area or to any number of uh, cities and regions, many of whom are planning to be the next Silicon Valley. Uh, Salt Lake City, Nashville, Austin, Portland, uh, Seattle has had explosive tech growth. Again, my cautionary tale that all those cities would be wise to kind of do some better planning to make sure that if if they begin to even get a hint of Silicon Valley-ness, that they'll accommodate uh, increasing growth better than this region has. I think maybe of all uh, places that I can think of nationally, um, the left-on-left opposition to housing um, is so staggering. (laughs) Um, and and so difficult a challenge um, that, yeah, companies are needing to get creative on how they can recruit and get people here without paying salaries that are going to put them out of business. Is there anything, is there, does anybody take into consideration in terms of urban planning, especially in some place like Marin, that you're going to need firefighters and post office workers and, you know, sanitation workers? And I assume all these people must come in from, outside the county to go to work and then return to their modestly priced home someplace else. In Nevada. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no joke. I mean, there are some crazy commutes right now. Um, We're not like New York City. We don't have this amazing rail system that would help enable those commutes, Mm. right? We, We have a lot of disconnected um, you know, they opened this train in Marin, the smart train, um, which goes, I think, from San Rafael to Sonoma. So you can't actually take it from San Francisco to Marin. So <laughs> it, it's, it's a str- I, oh. I don't really understand it. And, you know, high-speed rail we've been trying to build for God knows how many years, and um, which would really kind of help things along in a certain way. You know, you mention you know, workers, teachers, et cetera. This is a huge problem. There's a ton of hand-wringing going on and unfortunately not a lo- enough activity. Um, some cities say, well, we don't want to add housing because then we'll have to add services for these people, even though they already have these people that they need to house that they can't. Schools have, ma- uh, you know, massive teacher shortages in most of these major cities because teachers can't afford to live here anymore. Uh, the city of San Francisco has been trying for years to devote space and funds to uh, teacher housing uh, with very, very minimal success. I think they have one project in the works, but that's one project. You know, that might house, best case, like 40 teachers. So it's a huge problem, and people are commuting uh, ridiculous distances, or they're just leaving. Um, and, and it's becoming much like New York, or on its way anyway, to becoming um, a, only a high-income region. So, Allison, uh, in California, speaking of high tech and uh, Silicon Valley, Apple's completed a $5 billion building, making Mm -hmm. it the sixth, if I'm not mistaken, most expensive building in the world ever. The architect's fee alone, I'm assuming, is somewhere around half a billion dollars. Well, they're going to need to spend that on therapy, those architects. (laughs) (laughs) So, since since we can't do PowerPoint to podcast, uh, can you tell our listeners about this particular um, building? Sure. Um, It's funny. When I was the editor of Dwell, pretty much every single building I ever wrote about was referred to by somebody uh, as a spaceship. And I would be like, oh, God, can people not be (laughs) more original about this? Uh, (laughs) This one one actually um, earns the descriptor. Uh, It looks like a flying saucer. I actually, from above, I actually think it looks most like the old uh, finger control on the iPod for those listeners old enough to have oh, had the one wheel, of the, the wheel, the track um, wheel. Yeah. So, so yeah, picture um, a wheel. You could think of it looking like that. You could think of it as um, Bentham's Panopticon, which, of course, I'm not the first to. What's oh, yes, of course, about Bentham's Panopticon. Building, you <laughs> I, never think I, see, I think I had that for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you never see photographs of this building from the street. You only ever see it from above, which... Yeah. Oh. Um, 
is, is we'll be uh, fine if you're in a flying car. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. which, which which you won't need um, in this building, despite the fact that it has eleven thousand parking spaces. Eleven thousand wow. parking spaces. Yeah. So uh, the most striking among many details of this building is that it has three million square feet of office space and three million square feet of parking. Oh. And. You know, Cupertino, like most cities, does have parking requirements, but it does seem to me that, as I mentioned in the article, that there could have been some negotiation here about decreasing that and thinking a little bit more about transit. Um, you know, this building is very much, even though it was designed by um, Norman Foster, who's an architect, it definitely feels as if it was designed by a product designer. It feels like an iPhone. It's pristine and very geometric and frankly doesn't feel very human. Uh, Wired did a great uh, article in last month's issue, I believe, that had some amazing photographs, including of the workplaces, which were so minimalist and austere. Um, I mean, I'm definitely a messy desk kind of person, so I would have a really hard time. But even if you were the clean desk kind of person, like so you would need someone to come and clean the fingerprints um, twice a day, which I'm sure they oh. probably do as well. <laughs> yeah. they, um, yeah. they've e- they even have a custom-designed pizza container. So if you bring pizza back from the Apple cafeteria, you won't make a mess on your pristine desk. I wonder if Lord Foster came up with that pizza container personally. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure that um, that one of the team, that was their job. <laughs> Being lefty, progressive California, all forward thinking, mm-hmm. I mean, Apple, didn't they consider connecting the world's sixth most expensive building to trains or public transit or housing or mixed use or something? You would have thought that would have been logical. And this is something uh, that continues to strike me. Um, you know, every... You know, every week you read an article about Elon Musk, who, as he's sitting in traffic, thinks, oh, if only I could not be in this traffic anymore. What if I have a flying car or dig tunnels under L.A.? And, you know, you're you're seeing a lot of decisions made by people who only travel in single occupancy vehicles, either driving them themselves or being driven around. They don't know what it's like to wait for a bus or, frankly, to even walk down a city street. So they're not even taking these issues into account as they're planning their campuses. There's a whole Instagram account on the Tesla factory because there's no place for employees to park there. Uh, it's it's such the cobbler's new shoes, but this place that's building the presumably most advanced cars anywhere right now hasn't solved the problem of navigating capacity for its own employees. The story of people arriving at four o'clock in the morning for their shift so they can get a place to park before they go to work. Oh my God. Um, So, I mean, and I think that this is rampant um, in the Valley as a whole right now of people uh, really solving problems that they themselves face without thinking about problems that the larger population might face. I wrote a piece about this for the Times last year called, appropriately, Solving All the Wrong Problems, which kind of listed endless series of apps and products that are absolutely useless. Uh, I just read today about the closing of an umbrella sharing startup. That's their <laughs> sole business model. I mean, it's impossible to do satire anymore. It's, it's you know... If you were a person living in the world, and let's say you're a parent, uh, in my case, I'm a parent also taking care of an elderly parent. Like, I've got a lot of serious things that i got to contend with every day. I'm not finding solutions being developed that are addressing any of those. I talked to a kid once who really told me he wanted to get into the transportation space, that he was he was very enamored of Uber. And I said, oh, it would be great if uh, you could get into that space, but you could think about transportation solutions for parents with young children who have to get their kids to things after school. And he said, well, kids take the school bus. And I said, well, there are no school buses in the Bay Area. (laughs) And he said, well, there's school buses in Minnesota where I come from. I go, yeah, well, (laughs) you need to think outside um, your larger perspective. And I think that this is a real problem. So Apple is not only... um, you know, a circle that that basically uh, the the building basically faces inward into um, a nine thousand tree forest that is accessible only to people in the company and no one on the outside. So it is not an outward facing building in any stretch of the word. It is not connected to transit. Apple runs shuttles, as do many of the companies, but those are private shuttles. So that those are people driving on buses only with coworkers and nobody else. So. 
so I think what happens is you really get a breakdown or rather like a, an, an erasing of empathy because a lot of these companies now have workforces who only ever interact with colleagues. They buy coffee from someone who's an employee of their company. They are driven by someone who's an employee of their company. They ride on transportation that's only um, populated by people that they work with. They're not really interacting with anyone else who is not um, you know, immediately connected to their workplace. And they become less and less aware of the needs and um, behaviors of other people. And I think that it's really adversely affecting um, you know, the marketplace of ideas and certainly of innovation. It's like the Army when you live on a base. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everything's provided for you. You don't ever have to yeah. leave if you don't want. To. Yeah, except that in the army, you know, you're all people come from all walks of life, or well, they right. did in the fifties in the movies, but you know, right. these days the army, I guess, is a little not different. Quite the cross section of America either. Let yeah. me take a shot at satire, Allison. Uh, and I know you're fond of trailers. So <laughs> okay. if you got eleven thousand parking spaces and you've got a problem with transportation and housing. Why not mm-hmm. turn the 11,000 parking space parking lot into an RV park mm-hmm. that way they, can, they, they, don't, they can live on the premises Yeah, and never have to drive anywhere, just walk into the round building that faces inside, you know? Aren't there people in L.A. that work at the airport that live in one of the long-term parking lots? Yes. yes. You know, they've they've actually found evidence even of Google engineers living in the Google parking lot. Oh. Um housing costs are so high that there's a huge transient um population kind of uh, I would housing insecure, I guess you would call them. Um, I think that the idea of a trailer park is not far-fetched. In fact, uh, the Samsung campus in San Jose is right next to a plot of land that's zoned for trailer parks. Um, You can actually have really nice (laughs) trailer parks. Um, It's all about maintenance and upkeep. It's uh, as a housing paradigm, it's it's not a bad one. It just suffers a bad rap. Um, you'll notice I've r- written a couple books on um, building technologies and, and forms that get a bad rap, prefab included. There's lots of bad prefab, but there's lots of good prefab also. So I think that several companies are looking into this idea of um, not quite, but kind of flirting at the idea of a company town, of building sort of more mixed-use communities so they can provide some level of housing for their employees. Um, NIMBYs, which is a term I know you're familiar with in North Carolina because I wrote about at least one poor soul who really had a bad case of it. Um, NIMBY stands for not in my backyard, and the NIMBYs in California are rabid. And they don't want housing. They don't. They have a distrust of renters. They have a distrust of multifamily. They have a distrust of newcomers. Um, a million reasons why there shouldn't be mixed use. Um, there's a giant mall not far from Cupertino that could have been developed into a new housing thing. And again, um, there's been opposition to that dead mall turning into something else. So I, I want to stress that this is not solely the fault of companies. They could be more responsible, but um, you know, the city councils, as they change hands, are either sort of pro-growth or anti-growth, and, and a, a lot happens depending on who's sitting on those councils. Uh, yep. There's a lot of wealthy property owners who are quite happy with the property appreciation that they're seeing, and so they don't want any changes happening. And there's a ton of misconceptions about what um, new housing, especially multifamily or rental housing, can do to a neighborhood. There's this idea that renters are all, you know, like partying vagrants or something, when this isn't actually the case. Um, so, I guess you know, your I, I guess your two hundred thousand dollar a year Google engineers are really wanton people. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, I mean they're probably working. They're probably working fourteen-hour days and like going home and like playing video games and going to bed. So I, I don't know how rowdy, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to stereotype. But I, I think there are so many stereotypes about um, renters in particular and and what they might bring to a neighborhood. Uh, and, and some of the people that have that that hold that stereotype, most of them probably were renters at some point. <laughs> Yeah. In their lives early on. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah, definitely. Well, I also think, frankly, that um, it's hard to make a good multifamily building. And we live in a country that's that's pretty much still in love with the American dream ideal of the single family home. And, you know, there are a few architects, I could probably count them on one hand, who are doing really nice, livable multifamily units. 
there's a ton of those buildings that are most likely not designed by architects at all that are not places that people would want to live in. So I think it it's really um, the industry and developers and you know land use attorneys, et cetera, really think about how to kind of transform our obsession with a single family home into um, sort of like denser, livable environments. I think there's a lot of ways to do that, but I'm I'm not always seeing it in the marketplace. Allison, I understand you learned a great deal writing about the airstream that informed your book on prefabs, Mm -hmm. which has been the miracle promised to the American public for (laughs) decades. I have a collection on our site of architecture magazines going back to the 30s. And every five years or so, prefabs were the next great thing. How come prefabs really haven't caught on in a bigger way? Well, you know, just last week, um, I was like basically getting this huge pile on on Twitter of like, how did I not know about this new company that was going to crack the code? <laughs> you know, I don't want to be the person that's always like, yeah, I've heard it all before, but I have definitely become that person because <laughs> um, when I worked at Dwell, I would get like a venture capitalist in my office. This was like in 2003. I want to quit my tech job and open up this prefab company and I'm going to change the way this is done. And, you know, I would love it. I would love to see it happen, but why it hasn't happened here um, in America is is the case for a number of reasons. I mean, in Sweden, for example, or Japan, a ton of buildings are prefab. Um, mm-hmm. yes. It's just not discussed with the same level of disdain. It's just it's an efficient process. Like you, just like you wouldn't make a car out of individual parts. You know, it, it seems absurd in, in many places to, to make houses that way. We have such um, an entrenched and really unchanging building culture here in the United States. Sort of very, Even though unions are weakening overall, the building trades are a very strong union. They're very threatened by prefab. Um, a lot of the efforts that you see coming out about prefab tend to be coming from um, sort of inspired young architects who have the idea that they're going to be able to build a house like this, when in fact you really can't achieve any of the benefits of prefab doing one-offs. And I imagine that that list, that stack of magazines you have is like, you know, a a colleague of mine called it a prefab series of noble failures, like one more individual attempt at a beautiful house. And there was only that one house and you were never able to build a second one. And I think that's basically what happens. We don't have the scale to make it work. Um, we have too much of a conflict between the building trades and uh, the factory floor. Um, many places aren't zoned for manufactured housing. There's a terrible stigma around manufactured housing, so there's there's a lot up against it. I think in um, sort of very urban and sophisticated markets like San Francisco and New York, where you might get the audience that understands the benefits of prefab, it becomes so prohibitive because of land costs that it doesn't become a good option even for the people who are... Um, you know, very excited about it. I remember that there were a couple of uh, people that got close, and I'm not sure if these were during your tenure at Dwell or afterwards, but uh, two names come to mind. Uh, Michelle Kaufman, who I yep. understand is now at Google doing some yep. projects, and also Rocio Romero. Yeah, um, good friends of mine. I actually did like a big lecture tour. It was like the women of prefab. It was those two, Rocio and Michelle. Oh, nice. The women uh, of prefab. Was there (laughs) a calendar? (laughs) A t-shirt. There's got to be a t-shirt for this. Well, think about it. I I gave a talk once at the Automated Builders Consortium Convention, and I frankly was the only woman there who wasn't a secretary or a wife of of someone working at a a factory. It's not, you know, where you expect to find women. Um, I was pretty much heckled during my talk. They weren't super receptive. But um, some of the women doing the most interesting work in prefab, at least at that time, um, were women. Um, Michelle's company, unfortunately, uh, went bankrupt, and her whole store of designs got bought by Blue Homes, which is now only building super, super upscale houses. And yeah, she's now working at Google X and she's doing some very top secret prefab work with them. Um, Rocio Romero, I think, has had some success. Um, she's in a far less expensive market that still has pockets of you know sort of sophisticated urbanites who, who understand her product and it's a great product. Um, not for lack of talent, good design, and process, but it's it's really difficult. It's really difficult to find um, a factory that can do this work and a way to get those houses transported without having a network of um, manufacturing facilities. So, um, 
yeah, uh, I don't know that it's 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 any different right now. I think the signs of hope that I've seen are architects who try and apply prefabrication to multifamily buildings, um, which you're starting to see a lot of here in San Francisco. Uh, there's a guy, uh, Rick Holiday, who's done a few, few projects, another developer called Panoramic Interests, who's doing them and is trying to get this micro-unit uh, prefab project, which would be actually a really good solution to some of our housing shortage needs. Um, but San Francisco, for one, says the units are too small, which is a whole other issue <laughs> confronting the housing market here in the city. Allison, uh, I've lived in two um, mobile homes. I'm a big fan of uh, mobile homes. Nice thing is you want to rearrange the furniture, just slam on the brakes. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, we found a company called Valley Quality. It's in Wenatchee, Washington. Okay. And what they've been doing is they have been um, – I think they make mobile homes, but they make them obviously in the factory. They make them to stick built house uh, specifications. So the joists are two by fours, not one by twos. You know, all the windows, all the wiring, all the plumbing, it's all built to, you know, to factory specs, but also built to housing, you know, regular house, stick built house specs. And uh, I like it because they're, you know, they're really tight and because they're the same people doing the same job every day, you know, they're made to to really um, energy efficient because they're really unlike a stick built house where, you know, you cut corners and, and you've got gaps. And, uh, and somebody from Valley Quality said to me, Frank, think about this. Take a stick built house, divide it in half, put it on the back of a flatbed and drive it from San Diego to Seattle and see how much is left when you get there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you're right. They're modest sized homes anywhere from, I think, a thousand square feet to maybe 16, 1700 square feet. So, Well, Allison, I watched your interview with Paul Goldberger from a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And this was on YouTube. Yep. And I was the 93rd person to watch the, the interview. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is, I know it totally went viral, right? This, this is not a reflection on you or Paul, as it is the, the issue of getting the public engaged in these meaningful conversations. And what are you discovering lately? Is is the way to get the general public outside the regular architectural community more engaged in discussions of sustainability and connectivity? Uh, well, it's really hard. You know, when I was it dwell? I recognized that that we had a limited audience, um, but we did our best. We also had a, a pretty decent budget to send people to places all over the United States and outside, and really try and kind of bring this issue of of good design to the fore. But again, super niche. You know, max subscribers four hundred thousand. Right um, at its peak, Time Magazine had eight million. Okay, so it's it's a small it's a, a small percentage. So now it would seem with all these all these websites that you'd have a million places to get this kind of information. But unless you're predisposed to it, unless you're already interested in it, you're probably not going to log on to City Lab, say, which has a lot of good information. I could, by name right now, tell you all the architecture critics working at newspapers across the country. There's about six, which is ludicrous, but there it is. Um, (laughs) there There aren't actually... Newspapers have no staff to speak of. They can barely cover just regular local news, so they don't see it as a priority. The thing that's fascinating to me, though, is, you know, especially where I live, all anyone ever talks about is buildings. Like, literally, (laughs) all anyone ever talks about. But the newspapers aren't really covering them. Major media is sort of, but not really covering them. So what happens is I think there's a ton of misinformation out in the world that just then gets built upon. And so I think people are not at all informed about architecture. I think that people are, that a small number of people are interested in it. But again, those people can kind of find outlets to read about them. I don't think the general public is hearing much. Even at those small outlets, um, you know, I still have people asking me to write about architecture for free for the exposure. You know, it's, it's like the media landscape has become such that you know, people are getting paid ten dollars or nothing, you know, to write an article about these subjects, and frankly, almost all subjects now too. So, you know, I am lucky enough to have this amazing platform with the New York Times, where I try and write about issues that are pressing. It's always hard to know um, what's going to hit. Interestingly, this last one on Silicon Valley is shaping up to be one of the more popular ones because everyone is obsessed with reading about Silicon Valley. Sure. I hope that someone can read that article and take away that it's not just about Silicon Valley, it's about larger issues around the importance of good planning. Um, I don't know that that will be true, <laughs> but, um, 
but I can hope. Um, there's a lot of really smart, thoughtful people writing about these issues. It's 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 very sort of targeted and 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 very niche for the most part. And I think that it's rare that those voices um, become more mainstream. But we can all keep trying. But but I don't have I don't have a great solution. I'm I'm always trying to figure out at Spur ways to kind of get our message out to more people. You know, we have a magazine, we have a website, we have over um, 250 programs a year where we um, have forums on these topics, and we have you know fervent fans around transportation. I would say especially you know we'll do a, a bus rapid transit forum, and we'll have 250 people here. So wow. we're we're trying to reach people. Um, I think a lot of other cities, um, if they don't already have a spur-like organization, uh, we get calls all the time from people in other cities trying to develop them, uh, to kind of d- develop that constituency around these issues. I think there's, an, there's a new pretty healthy movement um, emerging called the Yimbies, the Yes in My Backyard oh. movement, um, that, are, that actually now have a national conference and have chapters uh, in states where this has become you know, sort of a pressing issue. Issue. Um, I, and I just read uh, before I got on the call that a number of tech companies locally are investing in these issues because they understand that in order to succeed, uh, their company needs to help the cause of housing. Um, I think uh, for me, it's about making all these connections that uh, the built environment is so much a part of our daily lives. I think um, it tends often to be written or discussed about as this separate thing. But I think you can't really separate it. And especially now when all this innovation is happening, driverless cars, uh, flying cars, whatever it is, if you don't think about how all these new things are going to impact your existing built environment, um, you're in trouble. Uh, even the guy, uh, Tony Fadell, who was the CEO of Nest, you know, those um, smart thermostats, yes. kind of, um, was interviewed by Fast Company last week and said that he really regrets uh, a lot of the stuff that he's created. He didn't realize the impact that this technology would have on the world, especially now that he's had kids. And wow. he didn't then speak to how he might remedy any of that situation. But I think what's happening is a lot of this stuff is being created and put out into the world without real consideration about what it might do. Um, this might be too far afield, but this whole Internet of Things, smart thermostats, refrigerators, etc. I think people don't really understand that if you buy into these appliances, um, the company that sold them to you is basically tracking when you're home, <laughs> what you're doing, your your patterns of use. Um, finding creative ways to sell you more and more things. And, and, you know, already I think when we're online, we see how many, t- if, you know, you do a search like, oh, it'd be great to go to Hawaii. And then next time you log on to, you know, your local newspaper, every ad is for Hawaii. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> like they've already figured out how to do that. So I, I think that um, people have not yet thought through the ethics of that. Uh, with all the kind of more urban innovations like, uh, driverless cars for one, I think we're far from figuring out what the um, what the pedestrian environment is in in that kind of uh, situation. You know, you, you, you joked about turning the parking spaces at Apple into housing units. Um, I actually think, let's say driverless cars take off as they're predicted by many to do right now, and they don't really need the parking capacity that we have right now. This country has gazillions of parking lots, especially, um, you know, stacked parking lots, not surface ones. And I think uh, for architects to get in the business of figuring out how to creatively retrofit parking lots, there's going to be a huge demand for that. Um, Since there's also, um, I think this was the last piece that I read about before Silicon Valley, um, a huge dearth of senior housing, the smart person is the one who's going to figure out how to turn all these parking lots into um, appealing senior living units because we're uh, about to face, I think, an even crazier housing shortage that people really even understand. I, I guess that the, the notion is that with a driverless car, once it drops you off at work, it goes somewhere else and doesn't park yeah. outside your. Oh, yeah. It'll bring That's, about the uh, the phrase "nimple," not in my parking lot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Allison, yeah. we've really had a great time talking with you, and really appreciate your joining us today. Thank you so oh, much. Well, thank you so much for having me. U.S. Motors Radio is underwritten by the Angelic. Sarah Salk of ModHomesRealty.com, the real estate agent who loves modernist houses just as much as you do. You can reach her at 919-601-7339. Okay, take us out, Tom. Visit usmodernist.org for more information about today's guests. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. 
U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of North Carolina Modernist Houses, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. U.S. Modernist Radio is not for everyone. Do not listen to U.S. Modernist Radio if you take architecture too seriously. (laughs) Consult your doctor or perhaps your psychiatrist if you listen to the program and experience arousal lasting more than four hours. (laughs) Side effects of U.S. Modernist Radio can include extended nighttime internet searches, purchasing too many coffee table books, and sponsoring architecture podcasts. (laughs) Do not combine with alcohol while driving. I'm Tom Guild. Stay safe, my friends, and we'll be back in two weeks with another edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Thank you.